Welcome, everyone. It's always such a pleasure to see everybody joining and see so many faces that are familiar and uh, then see some new faces in our community too. So thank you all for joining. And um, well, basically, hi, and welcome <clears throat> to this uh, Deep Transformation Network live conversation. What does a local future look like? And let, let me just spend a moment to give you a little bit of context on that. Um, of course, our community, our network is called the Deep Transformation Network. And the subtitle there is a global community to explore pathways, to explore pathways to an ecological civilization. Um, and one pathway that I think most of us probably agree seems kind of essential to get to that kind of uh, deeply transformed civilization would be one to move from the kind of globalization of the past few decades um, that's allowed just you know the transnational companies to dominate virtually every aspect of our lives um, and to move towards a more localized future and um, with things like food sovereignty and grassroots autonomy. Um, and you know of course it's one thing to say that it's another thing to actually look at what that might entail because it would need to incorporate so many different intersecting domains, like economic, political, industrial, agricultural, um, and cultural. Um, and so we're so embedded in this globalized world right now that for many of us, it's difficult to really envision what a more local community, a uh, more local world would actually look like. What would that local future look like? And that's why I'm so thrilled today to be in conversation with a pioneer of this way of thinking, Helena Norberg Hodge, who has spent much, in fact, I think most probably of her illustrious life showing us that there is a different way we can organize ourselves and achieve that flourishing. And Helena is one of the world's leading thinkers on this topic. She's founder of the international nonprofit uh, Local Futures and convener of World Localization Day. And she's also written um, some amazing books on that, um, on this topic. And I, I've actually, I've just recently completed one that she wrote a few years back called Local is Our Future, Steps to an Economics of Happiness, which is a wonderful summary of the whole topic. So I strongly recommend to anyone who wants a deeper understanding after our conversation today to actually uh, read that. Um, and our event uh, today lasts 75 minutes. Um, we're going to spend the first 30 minutes or so in direct conversation, then it will open up the floor to questions from all of you. So when the time comes, um, please be ready to put up your Zoom hand um, and ask your question directly. But if you'd rather write your question in the chat um, in, the in the next, uh, um, in the first half hour while we're talking, that's fine. Uh, if a question comes to you, but you don't really want to be public about it, and we'll try to catch those and incorporate in the session. So Helena, welcome. It's so great to have you here with our community. And I know you have tons of fans all around this network. And um, you started um, speaking about uh, globalization and the dangers of it and the need to like sh um, move back to a different kind of future decades ago, when most people were barely even aware that it was even happening. And uh, as I understand it, Helena, it was your years in Ladakh, way back when, in the 1970s and 80s, that caused you to become really passionate about it. So I wonder if you could actually start off just by talking to us about that time and what it was that led you to realize, how did you realize what was going on and what was it that caused that passion in you that's driven you for so many decades since then? Happy to do that. I've got a bit of a frog in my throat right now, but I think I can manage. <clears throat> yeah, I ended up in this place called Ladakh. It's the westernmost part of Tibet in 1975. Until that point, I had been quite, I was a nature lover. I was, um, you know, I was quite environmental, but I wasn't an activist. I was living in Paris. I was working as a linguist. And I was invited to go out to help make a film about this unknown part of the world that really no one had heard of. It's Ladakh, the westernmost part of Tibet, part of Tibet that belonged politically to India. I went out thinking I'd be there for six weeks. 
I ended up spending 40 years, sort of. I was there for many many years, for half of every year. My organization is still working there. I haven't been back myself for the last five, but Mm -hmm. 40 years I was there for much of every year because I found the most delightfully joyful, vibrant, healthy people I had ever encountered. And I think really in many parts of the world, you'd have to go back hundreds of years to find a people that were still in charge of their own lives, that had been able to evolve in their own ecosystem according to their own values and meeting their own needs in ways that had been experimented with and developed over thousands of years. So it was a a remarkable lesson in what's possible if Mm -hmm. we're allowed to use our own resources and develop them in ways that are based on deep experiential knowledge, a deep Mm -hmm. knowledge of specific ecosystems, a deep knowledge of the people we depend on. Now, these are lessons that I learned as I saw the global economy come into a place that had never known unemployment. I mean, completely, Mm -hmm. no one ever had, had never known poverty as we know poverty. And and as I say, the health was good. So then I saw this global economic system coming in. I saw suddenly butter that had been transported for weeks selling for half the price of local butter. Mm. And I later on ended up doing a study as it happens of butter because I was invited around the world to basically the story of Ladakh that I started telling right. appeared to many remote people around the world. And I saw that in Mongolia, where they had 20 million milk producing animals, there was no dairy from Mongolia in the no. market in Mombato. It came from Germany. So I became aware of this global economy with its completely unfair playing field because yeah. our governments have deregulated and and subsidized giant monopolies Mm -hmm. that they don't tax and as i say they don't regulate so this is how i had so yeah yeah, what i'm i'm so curious like when you were there in the first few years it must have kind of slowly dawned on you what was going on and that what was going on i also imagine there was a moment when you got a sense this is really bad like something bad is going on was there one or two actual experiences you had where you saw a shift, something that you'd been used to in the community and you saw that shifting and that had that impact on you? Well, for one thing, what happened was that I learned to speak the language fluently, fairly quickly. I was a linguist, as I said. Right. And so I was spending a lot of time with the Ladakhis. And then there were a lot of very interesting foreigners coming in, sort of world travelers and authors and filmmakers from around the world to to look at this incredible place and all the foreigners were saying what a paradise what a pity it has to be destroyed and I kept hearing that and I realized that my Ladakhi friends would be absolutely astounded to hear this because they had no idea about what was coming in from the outside or that that in any way was going to be destructive so I very quickly became a sort of ambassador between the two world. And yes, in terms of negative impacts, you know, the most extreme were that these goods coming in from the outside were selling for half the price of local products. But I suppose the most dramatic thing was that the entire project was based on fossil fuels, bringing in a big diesel generator to have light in the main town, and also other other form pesticides, Mm-hmm. Even outlawed pesticides like DDT were being promoted. And now, like I, I, I imagine, <laughs> Helena, tell me if it's true that when each of these things were happening, were a lot of the local people thrilled about it? They were like, "Great, we we have lights, and we have we have you know cheap um ele- cheap electricity, and we have uh, pesticides, so we can get rid of all the." So I imagine every one of those incremental shifts, they probably they probably felt was a positive, but then you saw the whole corrosion of the community and the corrosion of the of the values. And of course, I knew that DDT had been outlawed for very right. good reasons. They had yeah. no information about that. Yeah. I mean, they even literally started building a hospital mainly of asbestos 
And people found broken asbestos and started baking their bread on that instead of the stone uh, slabs they'd been using with absolutely no information provided. And I think here is a really important point too, which is that I started providing information to the Ladakis and I was accused by some people of telling the Ladakis what to do. Who was I as an outsider to come into the society and say, don't do this. Mm -hmm. What they didn't realize was, first of all, I didn't say, don't do this. I was providing information from the West and saying, do you know we've outlawed this because it causes all kinds of health problems. It's now banned. But interestingly enough, no one was saying, who are these corporations providing the adverts and the government? How are they coming in here and telling people what to do? Yeah. Which they were actively. Every day on the radio, there would be agricultural experts promoting the virtues of chemical fertilizer, pesticides, modern species, mm-hmm. including bringing in Jersey cows to a land where the Jersey cows could not even go to the grazing land. So then you have to import industrially produced pellets to feed these cows that are not suited to the environment. So this imposition of a global monoculture of standard species, toxic chemicals, that's really what this global economy has been doing all around the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, you recently um, helped to launch this great film, Planet Local, that I was just um, profoundly moved by when I watched it. Um, and uh, in, in fact, if we have the link to that, might be good to put that, um, if someone can put, put that in the chat. Um, but one thing that really struck me in that Planet Local, it, it kind of goes into really great detail about all the craziness, the insanity of globalization. And you had this one uh, scene where you were showing how um, fish that were caught in Scotland um, uh, were being shipped. Uh, was it like shrimp that were being caught in Scotland were being shipped all the way to Southeast Asia to be processed and then shipped all the way back to Scotland again? Like just these re- absolute insane uh, processes. And do you, do you want to talk more a little bit more about how globalization itself is has become not just so destructive, um, but so insane and essentially self-destructive for uh, our civilization. I mean, it's just tragic that most people are not informed, just like the Ladakis were not informed. Most people in the West are not informed of what's actually going on behind a lot of the products that are coming into their supermarkets, into their environment, because essentially, What's going on on a regular basis is that countries are importing and exporting the same product. The UK exports as much milk and butter as it imports. The US exports as much beef as it imports. Why? Because the system has been set up to favor global traders. Mm -hmm. The entire foundation of the modern economy was based on a principle of comparative advantage, which said, it's not in your interest to keep food security in your area. Don't produce a whole bunch of things for your own needs. Specialize what you're good in for export. Now, up to a certain point, this makes sense. You know, in Scotland, they can grow oats very easily, but we haven't understood how from the outset, this system, was founded in slavery Mm -hmm. and closures and colonialism. That drove people away from the land into cities where they became dependent on remote traders, on the elites and on remote Mm -hmm. traders. So we have to, from the foundations, look back at this economic system and its trajectory. We need to be aware that after the Second World War, there was a concerted attempt to prevent another depression in the West, to prevent another world war. And -hmm. there were many well-intentioned politicians, many well-intentioned people who thought, yes, the way to do that is to integrate all economic activity across the world. So what was set up was this one World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, and very important, a mechanism to stimulate and encourage ever more trade treaties. And Mm -hmm. that was called GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Mm -hmm. 
And this process then set off after the Second World War, fueled by so-called cheap fossil fuels, which mm -hmm. of course were never cheap, but this fueled this process of essentially supporting global business to enter markets everywhere to integrate. Now, very much with the help of the US, of course, and actually the process was everywhere destroying local economies, including mm -hmm. in America. So America itself was losing its own vitality, its own attention mm -hmm. to the ecological foundations of every economic activity. <clears throat> yeah. And I think, yeah. No, exactly. I and and I yeah. guess one of the things, it's such a, a great point that while this whole process of globalization and domination from the global north has devastated people in the global south, and the, those who live in the affluent areas in the global north also have their communities um, devastated and leave, live these lives of isolation and separation based on the same the same kind of uh, corporate processes. Um, and one thing I'd, I, 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 I would add, by the way, to what you're saying is just um, as I'm researching this a fair amount for my book I'm working on, An Ecological Civilization, what strikes me is how all of these, these so-called GATT and these trade treaties and, well, and WTO and everything coming after that, the, they set them up so that only the global North country, the most affluent country, the ones who basically won the Second World War, would have majority voting rights. So it's as if they're saying, okay, well, here's how we're going to set things up. We're, we're going to play this new game. And we're going to all play this game together, but we get to determine the rules. Um, and you guys don't. So you've got, and this has happened ever since, decade after decade. So that's what is so yes. devastating. Well, although I want to warn against <clears throat> too much of a focus on rich country, poor country. Okay. Because what's happened is that these global corporations, particularly over the last 35 years, have shifted their operations to so-called poor countries. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is they've influenced the environmental movement to campaign against the idea that poor countries need to reduce emissions. Mm -hmm. They have set up their big factories in China, in Indonesia, in India, in Mexico, where they want to be able to spew out lots of fossil fuel right. emissions. And they've influenced the environmental movement, as I say, to argue that no, no, poor countries don't need to reduce emissions. I would argue that one of the best ways for us to understand today why we are hurtling from crisis to crisis mm -hmm. is to understand this tragic way that global banks and corporations have been deregulated and subsidized. Our governments have subsidized the global infrastructure for them while neglecting the local infrastructure, local infrastructures, simple things that what farmers need in a region to mm -hmm. have healthy, diversified agriculture to provide for their region, the infrastructure's gone and mm -hmm. regulations strangle them. So yeah. all around the world at the local level, meaning place-based business, mm -hmm. we as individuals, smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses, we're all strangled with regulations, many right. of them completely counterproductive and heavily taxed. And the regulations are becoming more and more bureaucratic, more and more heavy-handed. Mm -hmm. In the meanwhile, those that operate globally, transnationals that are allowed to move around freely without any constraints, mm -hmm. setting up free trade zones, have no regulations and no taxes. Yeah. This is destroying the world from my point right. of view. I totally hear you. So let's turn to what we can do about it and what you've been working on so amazingly for um, for for so long. I mean, let's take a look at localization. And maybe you could just say for us, like what, what does localization mean? If somebody wants to just try to absorb it and then be able to communicate it to friends or family or whatever. Well, first of all, localization as we are promoting it is coming from an international perspective, from a lot of international experience with the recognition that we urgently need more deep dialogue, international exchange across the world to have a clearer picture, 
and to build up collaborative movements that are going to start insisting that our government, instead of deregulating um, you know, corporations that pay no tax, they need to start a process of regulating them uh-huh. with the goal of insisting that every business on this planet mm-hmm. needs to adhere to democratically um, created rules for business. Yeah. Business needs to be subjugated to the priorities of ecological balance and social justice. Mm-hmm. We are not going to have that if we keep deregulating global business and we keep allowing i do want to just add that yeah. global businesses now are ordering our governments to sign in these trade treaties isds clauses yeah. <clears throat> in these isds clauses which means investor state dispute settlements countries are signing in black and white we will not do anything that might reduce your profit-making capacity. If we do, you can take us to court. These courts are kangaroo courts, and it's happening all the time. Swedish nuclear power plant sues Germany for deciding to phase out nuclear power after Fukushima, and Germany has to pay a Swedish nuclear power company because they're gonna be losing profit. This is an insanity, and I really believe that the biggest biggest and you know the reason why we're in such a mess is that we are not allowed to look at this because those who have tried to raise this issue get silenced Mm -hmm. we are shadow banned by facebook because we're coming up with a bit of light and clarity about this central issue of Mm -hmm. the power of global banks and and could i just also quickly say that after 2008 Everyone in the world recognized that it was insane that some boys in pinstripe suits in the cities in front of their computers could Mm -hmm. gamble with the lives of people around the world with their mortgages, no idea who they were, no no names, no nothing, envelopes of mortgages traded in this irresponsible financial casino. The entire world recognized we needed rules in the financial markets. But did it happen? No. Obama and the rest told us, no, no, they're too big to fail, too Mm -hmm. big to fail. Now, we need to have the clarity to realize we don't want to suddenly ban, as of tomorrow, every bank. We can't suddenly, it's not going to serve our interest to say to Coca-Cola, from today till tomorrow, we're shutting you down. Mm -hmm. We need to have clarity and a vision to understand that, of course, we can start a process of re-regulation. We can start a process whereby there will be very little damage to the people employed by those corporations. Mm -hmm. We're having that discussion a little bit about fossil fuel companies, Mm -hmm. but unfortunately the picture is not holistic enough to understand the vital role of the financial markets and of other businesses. Sorry to be so long-winded. No, I'm I'm with you every step of the way, Helena. (laughs) And you know, what you're saying inspires me because like as I'm doing the research for this idea of what an ecological civilization can look like, what I keep coming back to again and again, it almost seems like the the single most important thing that can be done is to actually change the corporate charter for transnational corporations that they can, oh, they're only allowed to have a charter and it has to be renewed every few years, only if it meets those uh, three bottom lines, not just profit, but people and planet. And if there were actually like sort of chosen by sortition, not like the pinstripe suit regulators who basically go in and out with the corporations anyway, but actual citizens and citizens assemblers who determine every few years, um, does this corporate charter get renewed? Do they really meet those bottom lines? It would fundamentally change everything. And just that one that one shift, of course, it's a massive shift, but it's something that's doable. It's not something that involves like rocket science. It involves basically some legal shift and the political will. So I'm so with you on that. But I, I also wanted to turn our attention then to actually really going l- local. 
And looking at examples of what local, localization means in, in situ sort of thing, in, in the regions. And like, for example, I, there was one great example you gave in your book that I was mentioning of Tosapan in Mexico, which was so inspiring. And I, do, do you want to just tell us a little bit about what happened there in that community and why that is like a model for what's possible? Yes, I mean, this is a group of um, essentially a co-op in Mexico that started essentially protecting their local economy and limiting export. They have some coffee export, but they've been able to create thriving farms, thriving ecosystem, and a community fabric, a social fabric where they in their locale are caring for the land, for the for the water, mm -hmm. for what people care about. Now, I, I just want to say, though, that with this localization mm -hmm. process that we're encouraging, we have encouraged that people recognize that even in their own environments, I would urge all of you who are listening, who are interested, to try to put on these sort of global to local lenses. It's a different, it's a paradigm shift. And if you look in your region, you will probably find examples of bottom-up localization. And what that consists of, just like in Tosipan, is mm -hmm. people in a local area coming together to actually use experiential knowledge, their eyes, their experience, to support what they care about. And it's, for me, so heartening to see that this demonstrates general goodwill. Mm -hmm. People actually want to have cleaner water. Of course they do. Who actually wants to have food la la you know, laced with chemicals, old food from far away, costing less than fresh organic food. But we, because we've not been paying attention to the economic system, the food movement has tended to argue, well, you should be paying more for your food. If you care about a healthy environment and you're mm -hmm. responsible, you should mm -hmm. be paying more for your food. But actually, maybe a better message is mm -hmm. we shouldn't be subsidizing old toxic food. We need to be looking at policy. And in the meanwhile, if we come together at the local level, so classically, even a farmer's market is sort of one of the best examples of bottom-up localization. Right. When people come together in a farmer's market, you are suddenly seeing farmers earning 80, 90% of what you spend. In the supermarket, they get 10%. Mm -hmm. Farmers are earning more and you're paying less for fresh, healthy food. And if we're strategic about this, we are supporting this movement of local food initiatives so that they flourish and grow and multiply, right. not supporting one shop or one co-op to become bigger and bigger. So part of the vision of localization is understanding that when it comes to working with nature, the real economy, smaller is better. Mm -hmm. And I can say that almost as an absolute because I'm contrasting it with the scale that's been imposed by global right. traders and global businesses from the beginning of slavery, pushing people onto monocultures. Mm -hmm. So the, the global system is monocultural, larger and larger, more and more speedy, competitive, more resource intensive. The local path, which is starting from the bottom up, and demonstrating the benefits mm -hmm. is about slowing down, a scaling mm -hmm. down, human scale, and diversity on the land. Mm -hmm. So there's a structural link between markets closer to the farm and diversification on the land. Diversification on the land, we need to be talking in a holistic way um, because mm -hmm. regenerative agriculture has become very trendy but we have to watch out for the fact that it has been sanitized for corporate consumption right. because it's one dimensional and Nestle and Kellogg's and so on are boasting of being regen. So let's not try, uh, let's really try to be holistic in our land, mm -hmm. systemic, which is yeah. what, you know, what you and Jeremy are about. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you entirely, Helena. And I, I w w wanted to ask you because one one thing that I've I, I've come across, I'm sure you've come across it many times over the years, is oftentimes people when they look at this idea of localization, 
um, exactly as, you, as you're describing, regenerative agriculture and, and smaller is better and all that stuff go, great, fantastic. But we have ne- we have basically now 8 billion people on the earth um, and, you know, a third of them or whatever are food insecure. And, you know, we need um, all, all the, this global production, how we go, like, you know, we'll, if we get rid of the fertilizers and um, the synthetic fertilizer, get rid of the pesticide, how on earth are we going to feed 8 billion people that might become 10 billion before the center is out? Um, and what what's the answer to that? Why, you know, one, one thing I, I, I would add, by the way, just before you begin is um, I've re- recently just finished uh, George Monbiot's book, Regenesis, which is a real eye-opener book for me. I mean, I've, I was I thought I was learning so much. It was incredible. I was like making notes almost every page. And some of the things he said were quite disturbing for many people in the space of um, uh, agroecology or um, carbon farming and many other things. So I'm just curious what your perspectives are and how, how we can think about this issue. Well, again, you know, I've known George for 40 some years and yeah. I, he's so brilliant, but I think he's not looking at the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. And I think the tragedy is that, what the, the tragedy is that right now, all, there's been almost no institute, no university group, nothing that has been charged with looking honestly at the impact of this globalized economy, of these global finance markets and corporations, their impact on the land, on community, on identity around the world. They haven't seen that this is imposing a monoculture on the land, monocultures, and a human monoculture. So genuine individualism, as well as cultural diversity being eradicated, languages eradicated as we speak. Now, people at the grassroots have been resisting this monolithic system, and there have been so many campaigns to protect the land, to protect your culture, to protect your language, but not with a holistic view. And so this I would say more than anything, understanding the global economy, how it's come about, what it's doing, that's really what we must do to have greater clarity. Now that global economy has always been pushing urbanization. Now people like George take urbanization as a given. They don't look at how we might change policies right now to do the opposite. That's what the global to local vision is that we're trying to share. If we understand what we could do as a matter of policy, instead Mm -hmm. of lying down and saying, let's, yeah, we can't do anything. These are too big to fail. Listening to Yuval Harari, who Jeremy and I have shared, uh, thinking about Jeremy's written about him with George and Yuval, I'm absolutely convinced that they're good, well-intentioned people. But now it's about this bigger, picture, this bigger understanding, and it's, it is hard to come by. You have to do a lot of research. I ended up speaking eight languages. We've ended up, you know, my book, Ancient Futures and the film were translated into 40, over 40 languages. And so we had feedback from all these groups around the world saying, oh, what you're telling about Ladakh is our story too. So I felt confident both from particular experience in you know in so many different countries in my native country of sweden and seeing yeah yeah just all around the world getting this feedback but if we don't wake up to look at that bigger picture we end up trapped in thinking okay we've got these giant cities how are we going to feed them well actually the truth is that small diversified farms job rich with more people on the land small diversified will always be able to produce more per unit of land and water. The efficiency of the big monoculture, this this efficiency of scale was simply that it destroyed jobs. Mm -hmm. So yes, Mm -hmm. you could eliminate jobs and that was thought wonderful. You know, we're gonna use fossil fuels, we're gonna use big machines, bigger and bigger. And then we move into genetic engineering and genetic engineering is this magic formula to create more. 
Genetic engineering doesn't. Genetic engineering depends on wild biodiversity, which is eradicating. It's a blind, stupid, very, very dangerous direction. And I think most of us just with our eyes can look at these giant monocultures and say, yeah, no, with diversity, we could get more out of the land. So mm -hmm. actually shifting towards more, to literally shifting away fundamentally at the economic level from subsidizing and supporting more energy and technology mm -hmm. towards supporting more people, more eyes per acre, as one of the wise leaders in this movement, Wes Jackson talked about, mm -hmm. more yeah. eyes per acre. We can have mm -hmm. that deeper ecological worldview, that deep understanding of diversity. Anyone who's gardened will know, you know, just you plant two bushes right next to each other. They seem to be on the same soil. They're getting the same water, the same stuff. And yet one will grow a lot faster mm -hmm. than the other. Appreciating mm -hmm. that, picking the fruit when it's ripe, not coming with the machine, picking everything and then throwing away half of it. Right. The global mm -hmm. food economy, the global food system is the biggest contributor to climate change, right. to masses of plastic waste, to destruction of biodiversity, both wild and agricultural. It is absolutely a monster system and waking up to from today till tomorrow, supporting mm -hmm. more localized, diversified food economies is a win-win solution multiplier. We can start oh right God. where we are, but let's also lobby for policy change. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> great. I like that. Yeah, and and you know, and to, to your point, I've come across lots of studies, such as from the Rodale Institute, um, have produced really uh, powerful studies just showing that actually agroecology, when it's performed properly, uh, can actually outperform um, in terms of uh, productivity. So it's a matter of getting those ideas actually out there around the world. Um, but there was an, um, by the way, it, it, in a moment, I'm going to be turning to everyone to ask questions for you directly. So if there are questions that you have for, Hel for Helena, please get ready to put up your Zoom hand so um, you can um, you can ask her. And in fact, feel free to um, actually sort of click the Zoom hand even right now as we're talking so you can sort of get a place in line. Um, but one question I wanted to ask but before um, <clears throat> we open it up, is there was another issue I've come across an, a number of times when I talk about localization, <clears throat> which is the um, kind of critique some people some might have that the concern that it can lead to parochialism. That um, while globalization, I think pretty much everyone in this in this uh, group right now is aware of its corrosive, devastating effects economically. But there's also been this positive of a rise in planetary consciousness, um, and I'm curious how you see that risk or like how, how you how, how you perceive that and what your thoughts are about that is there a way for localism to be planetary too in a in a different dimension i love you jeremy i love you so much <laughs> so it's so wonderful at asking just the right questions and just you know you're such a lovely spirit Absolutely. What I am, what's so worrying is that most people today have only experienced, as it were, local backwaters, mm -hmm. towns that have been left yeah. behind for, in many cases, centuries. And that's true, particularly in the West, this sort of having been left behind. And people often do become a bit xenophobic, a bit mm -hmm. introverted. And of course, in extreme cases, you know, even inbred and all kinds of things. And in the so-called third world too. Now, most rural areas, people are made to feel that farming is backward and stupid. They're made to feel stupid. When that happens to people, yes, they often become inward looking and in many ways, you know, more greedy, also more vulnerable to the machinations of the advertising system, pressuring on them to be very different from who they are. So I totally understand why people think this sort of localism or localization would lead to this sort of <clears throat> narrow. However, what I'm seeing is both having experienced communities, not just Ladakh, but Bhutan, uh -huh. where we worked over a five year period, and amazingly, even living in a remote part of Spain throughout the 80s in a rural small village, 
part of Spain, I saw there too how the general psychological outlook was mm -hmm. much healthier than in the big cities. People were mm -hmm. open, friendly, and they had a lot of food security, producing a lot of their own food. And I saw the pressures where literally the new toy shop opened in a nearby village, and now it was Barbie and Rambo as role models. I saw the supermarket coming in and destroying the local economy. They were being pushed into the city, and I saw how basically the village died. Mm. But I saw that this was still a vibrant village that had a lot to teach us about intergenerational connection. That's one of the foundations of a healthier more localized economy. And we're not talking about everybody living on the land. We're not talking about everything being in the tiny village. Right. We see inside cities, the rebuilding of the human scale interdependence. Oh, we suddenly lost your, your audio, Helena. I'm not Link, sure what happened. Now? Do you hear me now? mute on us. <clears throat> hear me uh, now? Right in the middle of talking. Um, I wonder yeah. if we can figure, oh, it seems like everybody else can hear. I'm sorry. We can all hear. It was, it, it was, it was me who, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that you went mute, I went deaf oh, okay. uh, in, my, okay. in my audio. That's so funny. Okay. Anyway, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, so, but, sorry to interrupt. Then. <clears throat> so also my experience, and I'm saying even in Spain in the 80s, Spain had been through the Inquisition, Muslim invasions, women were wearing black. It wasn't the thriving culture that is the inspiration for me, you know, from Ladakh, where the status of women was very high. By the way, I grew up in Sweden, and I would argue that without a doubt that mm -hmm. women and the feminine had a much higher status in this ancient culture than in Sweden. Mm. Lot more to tell. Is lot. I do mm. hope people who are interested in the whole Ladakh thing will read my book, Ancient Futures. Mm -hmm. But so now what I'm seeing is that in the modern, in you know, the new incarnation of localization in towns like Portland, in you know, almost the whole sort of West Coast of North America, mm -hmm. and you find these pockets all around the world, even in South America, even in China, you're finding people coming together and say, wait a minute, we've lost community, we've lost the human scale, we've lost the adaptation to the wonders of a living earth. Mm -hmm. So we're now coming back to supporting local living economies where we connect to that fabric and where we can experience it. Mm. Now that to me opens up to this deep ecological worldview that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Opens us above all to the understanding that everything in life is unique and changing. It's the incredible diversity, mm. no two cells alike. And they're not alike from minute to minute, the same cell is changing. There's this mm. movement and shift in life. When we connect deeply with that, we are humbled. We become much more humble. We're no longer ruling our lives according to labels, left mm -hmm. brain labels, static labels about life. We are now in tune with that flow and it breeds deep contentment and deep mm -hmm. compassion and connection. Beautiful. And yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Helena. And um, that makes so, so so much sense to me. And right um, right now, I want to turn over to our questions. I just want to say one thing before we do that is um, I've been really inspired um, by this notion of cosmopolitan localism um, <clears throat> that it involves that, it's, that, that, that basically starts from exactly what you're describing and then looks at different levels of scale of recognizing our, in our connections with regions and with um, the, basically ultimately the broader um, of all of humanity and all of earth and looking at the ways in which we can amplify th those connections. And, and, and I do just want people to know that when um, two weeks from now at our next live Deep Transformation Network live members meeting, we're going to be doing that on the theme of Cosmo localism, basically, as a follow up to this conversation. So there'll be there'll be more about that. But right now, let's turn to Steve and um, Steve, I'll ask you to share your question for Helena. 
Oh, and one thing I'd say, I'm sorry, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry Steve, but before you begin, it, it, just in general, if I could just remind people not um, yeah, to keep their question f fairly concise, lots of people with their hands up right now, so I want to make sure we have space for everybody to get their voice in the room. So sorry for that, and over to you, Steve. Yeah, good day, Helena. This is the third time I've heard you in the last two or three months, <clears throat> and each time I'm going deeper with the localization, so much so that I'm about to start a farmer's market in our village. Oh, great. Um, yeah, and and I had a question um, I'd written down yesterday for today, but you've answered a lot of things. I've already, what you've talked about here, I'm overlaying that with my own local area and even down to talk to this person by name. I'm actually naming people who um, from out of view. But my question is, um, what are some key things to look out for in my startup phase, for which will start with a farmer's market, but this will grow to um, our, our broader local area? What are the key things to look out for in the startup phase? Well, thanks very much for that question. I would argue that the key thing that gets neglected is the need for education and it's big picture education so that people become more aware of the dominant system without falling into sort of extreme conspiracy theories that everybody at the top is conscious of the evil they're perpetrating. That's not helpful, but it is very important that we do understand how blind and dangerous the dominant system has become. And part of the education will include to re-examine and try to circumvent many of the regulations that look as though they are about public health and safety, but they aren't actually. They're very counterproductive for a genuine thriving local economy. So to educate yourself more about that and then find ways of getting more people to be fully informed and all the time trying to encourage this holistic view and a process view of where we're going. For instance, sometimes in starting farmers markets, people will think, well, local, okay, we're gonna say, we're only gonna have things in this market that come from less than 20 miles away or 50 miles away. That's not strategic. You know, To create a thriving market, you might well have something from a hundred kilometers away, possibly even further. If there is no wheat in the region and people want to make some muffins and sell them there, not to be too fundamentalist in terms of getting things moving in the right direction, because you'll still be better off you know, buying wheat from Australia and you'd be amazed at how much wheat is being imported into Australia from Europe. You know, so they're already starting the process by again, being more informed and educating the group that you'll be working with. Mm. Wow, great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. That's great. Thank you very much, Elena. And then- um, <clears throat> Be in touch with us, you might be able to help. I'm in Australia. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yep, will do. And um, Tom, do you want to uh, join us and ask your question? Sure. Uh, this one has been troubling me a lot, and I'm really mm -hmm. curious if you have any insights into it. Just how does the new localization take rapid climate change and other sources of global disruption seriously given the likelihood that these mega disruptions may generate so much local change that traditional local knowledge may no longer be applicable well this is again i'm saying that the bigger picture we're talking global to local so it means shedding light on the global shenanigans around framing of, of the environmental issue in the way that's making the average person in the west overwhelmed by guilt the finger has been pointed at the individual. Don't drive your car. Don't do this. Don't do that. In the meanwhile, our governments are subsidizing the change that increases emissions. And right now, tragically, we're set on a Green Deal direction that is about massively increasing the production of energy of all kinds, including nuclear and fossil fuels. But even when we're talking about giant solar farms, wind farms, they're bunging up wind farms in the north of Sweden in the forest, cutting down forests in an area where there's almost no wind because it suits the financial trading in carbon. 
So we need the exposing the global system and arguing for this localization is the most important thing we can do to prevent further catastrophic destruction. And in the meanwhile, anything we do at the local level to particularly create thriving food economies has this absolutely massive, massive benefit in terms of reducing uh, climate emissions and genuinely restoring carbon. But we have to see through the myth that George is now promoting with his book, Regenesis, that we cannot have any farming that's healthy. We can have farming that actually sequesters carbon while massively increasing productivity. But we're being now, you know, our thinking is so shrouded in narrow issue thinking, starting where we are, not looking at what was there before and where we could go if we move towards mm -hmm. diversification on the land, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. animals, animals where the poo is the most valuable fertilizer, creating those systems, we can sequester far more carbon than with a lot of the shite that's being promoted mm -hmm. as part of the whole carbon trading system. It's tragic. And on that uh, topic, wanted to just put, put into the, uh, the conversation, um, question that David Takahashi had um, that he put in the chat earlier, which is kind of similar to what you're just describing. He talks about would a global system, he says, that acted as a decentralized meta organizer, like a sort of Aspen forest, and could it move resources from areas of abundance um, to areas of need? And could that be a way in which we could have a globalized planetary system that was based on local? Well, I think... We've got to be really clear about the fact that the movement right now is extra, it's just, it's so unfair. You know, Amazon can fly things all around the world and mm -hmm. with their own airports, their own infrastructure supported by our government. If you and I want to post something across, the, you know, even sending a book between America and here is costing like $50. So we're not aware of the injustice of what's happening. So. Yes, in if we start getting some sanity into the system, right. so we don't have these hidden, you know, the welfare for global corporations. Mm -hmm. And we've got to look at it globally, <clears throat> not just mm -hmm. at the national level. You know, dealing with our national industries is not what it's about. It's about the global mobile and, again, take into account the finance markets. If we get sanity in there, of course, there could be exchange and support across the world. But right. Everywhere in the world, it makes sense to look at how can we create real food security right. by diversifying yeah. closer to where people are and starting to shift and support so that smaller towns can thrive instead of shifting. The entire global population is now being pushed by algorithms to move into bigger and bigger cities, to mm. mega cities. If this blind global agenda continues, where I believe most of our leaders are blind, they're not being forced to look at the bigger picture. And if we don't wake up from you know, the bottom where we do have deeper contact with our, both with the environment we care about and the community, I think we're doomed because the algorithmic financial pressures and blindness is gonna be pushing for 100% yeah. urbanization yeah. with a little bit of rewilding around uh, the edges, but that's it. I, yeah. I, I hear you, Helena. Thank you. And can we turn to Kate? Um, uh, you you want to um, share your question? And I don't know if you, if you have any, any video, Kate, or um, just audio. I'd like to just use audio because sure. I have bad internet connection. Sure, yeah. Um, Helena. I wanted to ask you if you could discuss the role of satiety in our shift to local, because when that? we're living in this global, the, the role of satiety, contentment with enough, because when we're living in this stressful globalization, we feel we must have more and more and more. But when we're living in a vibrant local community with relationships and connections and connection with the land, it feels we may be content with just enough. So I wondered if you could address that. 
Absolutely. I hope again you look at our film Planet Local because part of the dominant narrative has been to tell us that we're happier and happier and happier in this consumer culture. We've been made to feel guilty. There's been so much, you know, discussion of, you know, why are these teenagers in Switzerland or America who have everything, why are they so depressed? We don't have everything. We've been robbed of community and just as importantly, we've been robbed of deep communion with life. When I went back from Ladakh and saw that in Stockholm, more than half of every dwelling was inhabited by one person living alone. I really had, you know, this wake up of how isolated and lonely we are. And what that led to, there was a lot of depression, alcoholism, suicide, and that's getting covered up. We now have an epidemic of dreadful mental illness, particularly among young people worldwide. And there's a direct correlation to the extent to which they're pushed into this con urbanizing consumer culture. Right. So again, there are so many reasons why we're now looking, you know, what, what you're talking about in terms of feeling enough is enough is it's actually a move towards greater contentment, towards greater joy, towards less fear of aging because of the more cyclical intergenerational connections that happen quite naturally when we localize. And I'd ask you to even just, as I said, put on those lenses and you'll find when you go to the local farmer's market, you'll even see there more of the children and the elderly engaging with each other, people talking to each other. We've had some studies in the localization movement that showed that people in farmer's markets have 10 times more conversations with each other than they do in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are ways of supporting this and experiencing it near where you live. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, some, something that I love to look at is this notion of what we're really talking about is like increase in the quality of life rather than increase in the quantity of life. That oftentimes people talk about degrowth and um, well, that's a, we don't want to degrow. We want to have more and more, but it, we can actually have more and more of quality in our lives because that's what has been eviscerated, just devastated. And, and we do have su sufficiency. We have material sufficiency, at least people do in the global north. And those in the global south who don't have the sufficiency, it's not because there's not enough around in the world for them. It's because of these incredible unequal um, shifts in wealth that have continued to take place even after colonialism. So, yeah, so it's I really is that focus on quality, I think. So can we turn to Doug? And you want to um, join us, Doug? Indeed, I do. Uh, I'm hoping for more discussion of what life under localization would actually look like. Mm -hmm. For example, who's going to okay. make the phone? Who's getting ready right here? I put your little uh, garden book thing back on your. We're oh, having oh, that book. We're, we're having oh, trouble. Okay. I think with your audio, Doug. Uh, okay, I'm I'm unmuted. Okay, yeah. You, you want to try again? Because um, we, we we got the, the first half when you're asking what would life actually look like? And then you were saying, for example, but that's when... Yeah, for example, uh, who's going to make the clothes? And does that create a new hierarchy that becomes corporate mm -hmm. quickly? How do mm -hmm. we suppress that impulse? I think about how is the internet going to intersect with local? And who's going to do that work? And can it be done without returning to corporate structures? I think the specific talk will actually break down some of the resistance to going there because people are afraid of, because it's so vague. Mm. Yeah, well, that's good. To, good to hear. I think we in the well, my colleagues and I in the localization movement are pretty clear that the internet has been a major tool for globalization, been a major tool for the financial markets and for the growth of these giant businesses. And so part of the whole wake up, the global to local wake up would be that we would insist it's not going to be easy, but once we understand how it's been functioning and how it has served the Amazons and the Walmart and how it's been part of destroying the smaller towns that most people value, find more authentic and prefer, then we would demand that the Internet is no longer used for commercial needs. And the best thing would probably be to just remove it from commercial use altogether and use it for communication. 
use it particularly for now the vital need to monitor climate events to really with the agenda now instead of a world bank we have a world environment and social justice umbrella that world environment and social justice umbrella is put in place by us recognizing that allowing economic extraction by a few global corporations does not serve anybody's interest even when you were the head of Exxon, you were running faster and faster because you knew there would be a merger with mobile. You knew there'd only be one job. It's created this thing where people are running after their own tail faster and faster, more and more afraid. It's a fear-based and a speedy system where we're now competing with algorithms. So the slowing down and understanding the umbrella we need, what's really gonna avoid war, what's really gonna protect us from climate disaster, is to have this environmental and social protection structure. And that can benefit from the use of the internet and communication across the world. Yeah. We could all benefit from that. So that would be one aspect of the clothes. Is there any reason why every country should not produce its own clothing? Any reason at all. If we produce our own clothing, what does it mean? There are more jobs in our country. Producing clothing can be a very enjoyable practice. But I also just wanna stress again, that is, you know, producing food as part of the more diversified, smaller scale, job rich farms actually is getting so much interest from young people now because mm -hmm. there's, I believe, an innate DNA relationship that we had in our entire evolution with the gathering, the harvesting, the hunting, the growing processing and cooking and eating together. That food economy has been central in our entire evolution. As we bring that back into our communities, we are seeing that it heals prisoners, hardened prisoners, torture victims, depressed people. It's a, it's a reconnection with life that is doubly enjoyable because you're also doing something very productive, something that benefits other people the benefits health of the ecosystem and you. So I really, I, yeah, I hope that we can really wake up to how deprived we've been and how what's happened to us as we were pushed away from our deep engagement with the natural world. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Helena. And I do think that a part of it, of course, is exactly how I introduced things at the beginning, which is that we're, we're so embedded in this globalized world right now it's very difficult for us to even conceive that we could organize ourselves in a different way, which is really what, what excites me about this whole notion of an ecological civilization. Basically, all the answers are there. It's just a matter of weaving them together. And, and then it's really all about the political will of moving into, into that direction. So yeah, that's great. Um, and um, let's turn to Bill and welcome, Bill. Um, really great to, to see you in, in, in our community. And um, let's ask, uh, let's turn to you for your question for Helena. Well, first of all, uh, Helena, how delicious it is to meet you. Uh, I uh, feel deep resonance with, uh, I've been keeping track, it's 99% of the assertions that you've made. And we could get to the 1% offline, but I just really appreciate the work that you've done and the exploration and the size of your mission. It's just absolutely spot on. Uh, my work is in cultural change in corporations. And I've uh, dedicated most of my life to that. And I see a need for a very fundamental shift in our organizing and developmental paradigm from what I would call a control over paradigm to an evolved with paradigm. I see communities, not only communities of place, which is what we've been speaking about primarily, but also communities of purpose mm -hmm. as needing and, and being ready. Now I'm not saying all of them, but there are communities of 
Bill, if I could just j- 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 just interrupt and ask you if you could just move to the specific question, just because I see all the people in line still, and we're getting closer to the end. So, but if you had a specific question for Helena, it would okay. be great if you could ask that. So, without the, without the context, then the question is, what commun what community capacities? Mm-hmm. You think it's most important to be developed for them to become wise communities and participants in a wizard network of communities. Mm. But are the community capacities yeah. as distinct from individual capacities? Right. Yeah, well, I first of all, I'm trying to encourage communities of place, in other words, localized communities. I think we're all developing wonderful, as I am with Jeremy, you know, wonderful community on the web, far removed from each other, and that's important. But I think the deep longing we have is for that face-to-face, deeper, ongoing connection that grows with time and where we know that we can rely on one another. This is is something that's missing in our lives. I myself am finding that with a mobile phone, and I'm so aware that it's the technology because I've lived without it, is actually enabling and encouraging so many different relationships. And I love, I'm having where I'm living now so many as it were friends, but it's all feeling shallow. It's not feeling, it's not feeding what I believe or what I feel I need, which is deeper ongoing relationships that grow over time where I know that we can count on one another. So I would urge people to look for that. One of the ways to build it is to actually perhaps maybe show one of our films and encourage that you get together with a few friends or maybe colleagues, not always people in in your family, to explore how can we build a deeper community fabric. And it it means being vulnerable, means talking about eating addictions or deep problems that we often want to hide Mm -hmm. because we need to be able to be feel that we are appreciated as whole beings with our flaws. We've been subjected to images of perfection and that has destroyed our self-esteem, destroyed our security. So I guess that would be one of the most important Uh things. Thank you so much, Helena. What a great, yeah, this made me feel good in my heart just hearing you describe that. Thank you. Um, And let's uh, turn to uh, uh, Elizabeth. Welcome, Elizabeth. Great to see you there. Aloha. Is my mic working? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> nice to Helena, see you. Helena, <laughs> Helena knows the extreme challenge I had yesterday with yes. my microphone on a new computer. Right. Anyway, I, I'm solidly a localist. I've lived most of my adult life in local communities in Spain, in Greece, in Peru, places. Uh, but my question is more connected with what Doug is asking. Yes, every country should be able to produce its own clothes, but every local community can't. Uh, and and I know so many wonderful new green, truly green, clean technologies, <clears throat> even for hydrogen dirigibles that are, have no pollution whatsoever and can move very fast and carry very big loads. But all of those things still require, you know, real production facilities. And I'm I'm thinking ahead about what technologies can we take into the future and how do we connect that with the localist movement that it's relatively easy to produce enough food to keep keep people alive and, and quite happy with diverse eating. Uh, in a local place, but almost everything else about life is harder um, so. I, I don't know. Do you know Ross Jackson's uh, Guy and League idea? Oh, very, very well. He's a close friend, and okay. I've worked with him from See, the very I, beginning. Yeah, I loved his idea, but when this was for the benefit of everyone else, just getting a few local, small nations to withdraw from the World Trade Organization yeah. and trade with you know, each other. That was other. actually my idea. He got it from Oh, me. wonderful. <laughs> oh, I'm so delighted yeah. to know that. Well, it's I heard right. he told me about it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what happens. Yeah, was, you, yeah. you remember the person yeah. who tells you. Yeah, uh, yeah but no, I that's tried. Just, I tried it in New Zealand, for example, and basically, long story, very short, they said, what? We just got accepted into the big league and you want us to go small again. Yeah, yeah. The fact that many small 
is what we need as human beings. It's how we evolved, you know. And the thing about the smaller human scale is that we don't realize that we are being ruled by people whose name we don't know. We don't can't set a name to it. It's this anonymity. Let's just keep in mind what happens when we try to ring a government agency or a big corporation on sitting there for hours, sometimes waiting to talk to a human being, because all these algorithms, all these tools are serving this centralization of power, completely linked to why in every country, the gap between rich and poor is widening in an obscene way. When are we going to wake up to the fact that it's exactly the same trajectory that is creating that gap that is decimating the earth and that is decimating our well being, our inner well being? This is what the global to local vision that we're trying to share is all about is connecting those dots. And then we'll see that we evolved in smaller groups. We'll see that small is where we thrive. The land thrives, we thrive. And many, many small is how we can come back to peace and genuine sustainability. Now, the big question is the transition. But, you know, Elizabeth, you were saying that many of the other things besides food are so difficult. Again, I've seen in old local and new local that actually when people come together for all the basic needs, food, clothing, shelter, when they come together to do clothing, when they come together to build houses, when you have the right number of people, the building of a house can be a joy, can actually be a fun enterprise. And when you're using non-toxic, which means non-industrial, non-corporate materials and paints, it's even a healthy enterprise. Mm -hmm. So then what I'm seeing too in the new local, where people then have the chance to do a bit less work, you see culture thriving, you see music, creativity, art, crafts, and people developing multiple skills. And just to come back to that, what you were mentioning about Ross, you know, the idea as part of the transition, which I think is going to happen, is that an, a smaller group of countries will come together to decide we're going to support each other to stand up to this corporate empire. And Again, it'll only happen if there's enough awareness and if the social and ecological movements come together to see that we're talking about, as I say, we know that the welfare of the planet is our welfare. What we haven't looked at enough is how we learn from indigenous cultures, from nature-based cultures, rather than thinking we can go straight to nature, mm -hmm. because it's from nature-based cultures that we learn about social organization, that we learn that every mother can have 10 caretakers for every child, that every person who's aging is so deeply connected to the life that's going on is an important member, so we don't fear aging. There are, there are yeah, but there are so yeah, many- well, thanks. Well, <clears throat> So let me just uh, kind of turn to, I'm just aware of the time right now, just the last couple of minutes. Maybe we can have time for one more question from Jennifer and to Diana and Carrie. My apologies, we didn't get to you, but um, I will be uploading this, uh, uh, the recording of this onto the network. And maybe you could ask your question there um, when on the post that's uploaded so that then um, maybe Helena might have a chance to be able to respond actually to you on the network. Or, so um, Jennifer. Hi, you, thank you. This try, might be a fun back. final question. Yeah, so let's uh, say all these invisible powers that be that are making us global and running the world said, okay, Helena, we believe you. We want to do this localization thing. Lead us and don't worry about the regulations. We'll figure it out. We'll unwind whatever we need to unwind. What are the top, I don't know, five things that you would get us on the road to doing immediately? Well, I say the number one thing is, well, actually, I often like to leave people with five words. The first one is connect so that you as an individual don't take this on. You form a group. And ideally, you form that group with that deeper psychological insight that you want to be in a sharing group where you can also be vulnerable and feel connected and supported. So when you change your eye to a we, then the project of taking on this big system isn't so enormous. But even then, in that small group, I would urge you to take the, so the first step, actually, I, I now use the language of reconnect, rethink, resist, 
renew and celebrate. So the connection or the reconnection is to you're changing the I to a we, and then in that group, you rethink some basic assumptions. It can be done very quickly. We have materials that can help you do that. And then the resistance is as much as anything about big picture activism. It's about forming a platform where you start disseminating this, oh my God, we've been deceived. We thought that we were doing the right thing, lobbying for poor countries, not reducing emissions. We thought we were doing the right thing by focusing on putting all our investment into an electric car. We didn't, you know, we haven't been, given access to information about what are the best things we need to do. So that message needs to get out along with the renewal message, which is actually there are actions that you can take, your group, but the big picture activism that I would like people to engage in is both disseminating the picture of resistance and renewal, or if you like, resisting further globalization and supporting localization. There is localization going on that's beginning to influence policy. It's from the bottom up. So it's usually mayors and cities, it might be regional. In Ottawa and Canada, they've done quite a lot of meaningful work to support local food economies. And again, to come back to local food also, realize that if we were able to bring about a shift so that people around the world were genuinely food secure from healthy diversified agriculture, the entire world would be completely transformed. Yeah. The military industrial complex lives off alienating us from that. So it's a, yeah, those are, those are some of the things, but also please do contact us, think of forming a group. And yeah, I really hope that also with yeah. Jeremy that we'll be collaborating more deeply. Yes, well, thank you so much, Helena, for this amazing, <clears throat> amazing uh, conversation. And I think I'm sure everyone, just like me, is both inspired and also feeling just that sense of clarity around it. Like we, we can really see this vision of what's possible. And what a gift that you can offer that to us and to others all, all around the world right now. And it's what we need. So thanks for that. And um, for, for everyone who is still here right now, I just want to um, actually um, remind you that, in fact, so two weeks from now, we're going to be having our monthly DTN um, live network converse conversation with all of us around the, the globe basically connecting. Um, but the topic is going to be a follow-on from this conversation on cosmopolitan localism or cosmo-localism. And we're going to actually have uh, a panel of people who have been engaged either in, with localism, than, like actual examples, or also have written um, about what that actually means to connect all these different layers. Um, so, and one one other thing just to leave you with is there's been a lot of talk obviously about how we can, we need to connect more locally, even when we have these global connections. And DTN is gonna be following this path. Um, well, I'll be announcing this uh, two weeks from now, but DTN is gonna go local too. We're going to start to um, connect with people locally from this big community where we are. So we can actually meet in person and figure out ways to get together face to face, just like Helen has been uh, talking about. So thanks so much to all of you for being part of this and uh, see you again fairly soon. And Helena, look forward to staying in close touch. As always, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. In fact, yeah. I'd love to be part of that panel in two weeks. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I really, right. And I really hope we can collaborate deeply like that. All thank right, you. take care now. Thanks, Bye. Jeremy. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Everybody. Bye.